I'm delighted now to be joined by Professor Martin Birchall, senior author of the paper on stem cell windpipe replacement in a child. Martin, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Stem cell based tissue engineered grass rebuilding organs is an exciting new field. Can you remind us a little bit of the biology uh, behind the approach and how it's been successfully done to date? Sure. Uh, the drive to regenerate uh, parts of the body is a uh, a long-held human desire goes right the way back to the apothecaries of the Middle Ages. Uh, it was enshrined in things like Frankenstein and Mary Shelley and goes back to Greek mythology. Most recently people seeing the new Spider-Man movie would have seen how a scientist tried to recreate the regenerative ability of a, a large lizard, a salamander or a, a newt, uh, to regenerate human body parts. Um, sadly we're not able to do that. Um, a scientist at University College London, Jeremy Brock, has shown that salamanders and newts have very different genetic makeups when it comes to healing compared to human beings, and some very good reasons why that is. Therefore, we've had to rely on conventional solutions to replacing the organs in the body, and over the last 60, 70 years, we've relied increasingly on transplantation of organs. So today, it's routine for people with renal failure. Uh, to undergo uh, kidney transplantation, people with heart failure to have heart transplants. Sadly, however, there are big problems, despite all the big successes, with transplantation. There's a lack of donors, and there's potential for infection, and you have to go on long-term immunosuppression drugs, which have severe side effects and can lead to all sorts of problems, particularly infection, uh, high blood pressure, and even cancers. And so, how much better it would be if we could actually build organs from people's own stem cells the stem cells that we have in our own bodies that are responsible for rebuilding us and repairing us, our inbuilt puncture repair kits, as it were, if we could use those to make new body parts. The field has moved on really very rapidly in the last four or five years, but actually goes back to the late 1990s when uh, Tony Atala, a urologist who was then working at Harvard, uh, first put a, a new bladder replacement into a small child. That technology has moved on and now is probably the best a known example of successful tissue engineering uh, and he's able to, children with spina bifida for example who previously had serious bladder problems are now able to avoid normally as a result of that, as a result of his clinical trials. So we are now moving on quite rapidly to being able to build more and more complex tissues uh, but there are many many questions that we still need to answer, uh, questions to do with ethics, to do with cost, to do with the basic science behind it and actually how we actually get these new expensive treatments into the people who need them as quickly as possible. You did just allude to some work with children in, in, your, in your recent answer, but um, this particular paper focuses on the reconstruction of a child's trachea. Has this sort of procedure ever been done before in a paediatric setting? So there are particular challenges in children. Um, previously, uh, people have tended to develop these technologies in adults. Uh, for all sorts of reasons. Um, again, the best known example of um, tissue engineered replacements in children is that of Tony Atala's bladder replacements and he's, his team who are now based at Wake Forest University in North Carolina uh, and are strongly supported by the NIH and other institutions um, are able to produce um, other parts of the urinary tract such as ureters and urethras and, and other organs too and working very hard in fact on trying to replace whole kidneys. So, so yes, this has been done in children before, but the only real clinical trials have been in uh, the bladder and more recently the, the urethra. Um, this would be the first time, however, that stem cells have been used in a child to recreate an organ. And what are the particular challenges that uh, you face when, when working with a child compared to, to a procedure with an adult? Uh, there are many issues uh, you have to consider when working with a child that don't apply to adults. Firstly, children are not small adults. Uh, and this applies to all branches of medicine. They have different considerations. There are ethical, moral, and strong emotional uh, reasons why people tend to go into adults first. Some of the big issues with operating on children, particularly with such experimental technology, uh, surround firstly the potential for growth. So anything you put into a small child needs to be able to grow as that child grows. And we don't know for certain yet whether the tissue engineered technologies will grow. I believe that by using stem cells, particularly the child's own stem cells, there is an extremely high probability of that happening. But that work has not been done yet. And we need to do lar larger studies of that. Um, other issues with children are the fact that they are going to have long lives ahead of them. So whilst in an adult it might be acceptable, so for example putting in a new knee joint, you might expect that to last for these days uh, 5, 10, maybe 15 years. 
Um, in a child, a, a replacement needs to last a lot longer than that. And we don't know what the true longevity of these structures are. And we don't really know what the very, very long-term effects are of putting cells like this into the body. Most of the evidence suggests that if you put a stem cell uh, into uh, a tissue replacement like this, they don't really hang around that long. But if they were, would they later on develop tumours? We don't know the answer to these questions. With the particular paper that you've been working on, what was the history of the patient? And, and how did you go about creating this tissue-engineered trachea? Well, we'd worked very hard in the laboratory um, and in preclinical experiments to uh, develop a tissue-engineered replacement for adults. And we'd had a major success in a young woman in Spain in 2008 where we'd replaced uh, a, a windpipe that had been diseased due to tuberculosis. Uh, and she's still alive and well and working today. So we had some clinical success, but had gone back to the laboratory to try and answer some more questions. When in uh, late November of uh, 2009, I was phoned by Martin Elliott, who is the first author on this paper, and who is uh, the head of cardiothoracic surgery and medical director at Great Ormond Street. He's a world-renowned um, airway surgeon. And he was faced with an extremely difficult clinical problem. This was a child who'd been born with a very narrow trachea, a narrow windpipe, that had had a number of procedures uh, over the child's 10 years to keep it open. And one of these procedures had culminated in a, a metal tube being used to hold the windpipe open. And this metal tube, called a stent, had eroded, uh, gone through the wall into the big blood vessel in the chest called the aorta, uh, and had caused a major hemorrhage. Happily, the hemorrhage stopped, but there was really very little time in which to generate something for this child, and there were no conventional solutions. There was nothing conventionally available which could have kept this 10-year-old boy alive. Uh, we knew that we could do something for adults. We'd never done it for children before. And we also knew we didn't have the time to, that we had to prepare something for um, Claudia Castilla in Spain. So we used an accelerated protocol based on some work in Germany where they developed uh, tissue-engineered skin, which allowed us to use some special messenger molecules called cytokines, uh, together with the child's own uh, stem cells, all of which were put in in theatre on the same day as the operation. We managed to get a scaffold, from, uh, by, uh, which was kindly donated by the Italian transplant authorities uh, in Florence. Um, and onto this we put the child's st stem cells, um, which we separated out, uh, and we put the, the stimulating molecules on and implanted it in the child. Martinelli did a wonderful operation to repair the blood vessel, um, and the immediate result was very good. And what successes have you seen since then? Well, to say that it's been uh, a uh, problem-free ride is not true. Um, this, uh, the little boy was in hospital for uh, six months after that um, with a succession of problems. Remember, this is extremely new technology and we're finding out about it as we're going along. This is not technology that you can really learn about in full in, in animal experiments or in a box in the laboratory. You only really start to learn about it once it's in the person. And so we had to deal with lots of inflammation, we had to deal with problems with the stents that we'd put in, which were a different type of stent uh, developed in the Czech Republic. Uh, and we had to deal with um, all sorts of other issues around infection and, and the fact that mucus was not moving along properly. But by the end of the six months, we'd gradually seen the windpipe strengthen, uh, we'd seen uh, the lining develop nicely, and by nine months, uh, he had a, a wonderful lining. And in fact, uh, in the last uh, nine or ten months, we've not had to do anything to him at all. Uh, and this has been the first period he's had like that, really since his birth. He's back at school, uh, he recently travelled to the United States, he was on Irish national television playing the drums at Christmas. He's a really happy lad. And importantly, he's growing and it looks like his windpipe's growing too. And there's been a, a two-year follow-up on, on this particular paper? That's yes, slightly more than two years. The operation was done in March in 2010. So as we, as we sit here, it's a bit more than that. And this is the first time that any stem cell-based organ or product has been followed up for this kind of length of time. Normally, reports tend to come out very quickly in the first three to six months. But here, we have, for the first time, long-term evidence that stem cell-based organ replacement can work and does offer a true replacement to organ transplantation in the long term. So just on that, on that um, final note, the results of this paper, what does that sort of give you an enormous amount of optimism for the future? Uh, it really does. Um, we really were working in the dark a lot of the time. We had a lot of a priori evidence in the laboratory that this kind of technology would work. And we knew that similar technology, uh, but n not stem cell related, had worked in America. So, so we had high hopes for it. But we are still learning on the job, as it were. 
What we do know is that there is a, a continuous stream of needy adults and children coming to our doors saying, we've reached the end of the road, we need something to keep ourselves alive. And that is why we urgently need clinical trials of these devices that we can enter these patients into so they can be studied properly and at the same time we can start to address these very seriously old children and adults. Happily, the Medical Research Council are uh, supporting a number of trials like this um, and we're also supported by a number of charities such as Sparks, the children's charity. And with the help of people like this and the government's reorganisation for regenerative medicine funding in this country, uh, we think the UK is very likely to be and remain a world leader in stem cell research. Martin, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure.